We began worship to this day with a prayer from the Book of Common Prayer. The Book of Common Prayer, which then informs our own Methodist Book of Worship. And in it we find the words, God, the Savior of the world, who by the cross and precious blood hast redeem us, save us and help us, we some humbly beseech thee, O Lord. That phrase, by thy cross and precious blood. We start talking about blood, and you know, we have a lot of hymns about blood. Washed in the blood, fountain filled with blood, nothing but the blood. How many hymns can you think of that have blood somewhere in them? It's all over the place, right? Blood is all over the place. And the blood of Jesus is important. That, that's something they, they knew back then, as we know today. But they knew a lot more about blood back then. Because they, they were part of this way of living where there was this, this sacrifice that we just read about, uh, this sacrifice, this offering, this scapegoating, where the, the scapegoat is sent out into the wilderness with the sin of, of the people, and, um, and the, uh, another goat is killed. And, and this is the Day of Atonement. This is the, the high point of the year. It's this offering, along with the other offerings throughout every day, throughout the, the, the worship of the Jewish people. That is how sin was cleansed and handled. And so they saw blood very differently than we do today. When we think of blood, do you handle blood without gloves on? Maybe, probably not. If you see blood on your counter, you get that cleaned up pretty quick, right? Blood is what transmits infectious disease. Blood is dirty. Blood is not something we like to see. And there even are even people such as my wife who can't stand the when you cut into a, a medium rare steak and the blood starts to kind of cool, pull. She doesn't like that at all. And some of y'all might not either. I think it's wonderful, but. She thinks I'm gross. The point being, we don't look at blood like they did back then. Back then, you, you notice how they're like tossing blood all over the place? I mean, they, have the, they want to clean the altar, and so how do you clean the altar? You wipe it down with blood. And you want to make mark that it's purified? You sprinkle blood on it seven times. I mean, blood is used at, to clean because nothing was seen as cleaner than the blood of, of a, something that has been sacrificed. And so in that day, 2,000 years ago, just like soap, we use soap to cut grease, they use blood to clean sin. That was, if you think of blood as like tied for sin, that, that's about right. It's, it's their all-purpose cleaning solution for anything to do with moral fail, failure. Blood is not dirty, blood is pure, and they use it to clean everything. And, and we see that, um, that is how we talk about blood today. We, we lose this idea that blood is, is clean, and then we, when we start talking about sacrifice and blood, what ends up happening is, is instead of having this kind of full sense of how it works, we, we get this very narrow sense that, that what happens on the cross, there is one way of viewing it, and that that's kind of often seen as the God is angry theory of what happens on the cross. Jesus spills his blood. He is crucified because God is angry. And the logic goes like this. God is infinitely offended by our sin and he takes all of the anger at, her, at, his, at us for our sin and he pours it out onto his son and, and, and kills his son because he is angry at us and at our sin and so that we can be forgiven. That's what I have heard it preached many times. This idea that Jesus is sacrificed by God the Father because of God's anger and wrath and indignation over our sin. And what this, this leads to some thoughts like that God is allergic to sin, even though Jesus eats with sinners. That um, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus, not us, because if he saw us, he'd take us out. That there's, that there's this infinite God who's infinitely offended by even the smallest of sin. And it really, this way of talking about sacrifice and blood that... Uh, what sort of develops in, in the Protestant church in the last century, it, it gets kind of unhealthy because what you end up looking at is, is a God who seems like an angry God who's willing to kill his son. It's like he's winding up to take a swing at us and at the last second he kills his son instead of taking us out. And that, that's how we talk about blood and, and sacrifice, that the God the Father kills God his son to take us out, or instead of taking us out. And that way of talking about the cross, that way of talking about blood, that way of talking about sacrifice, it's unfortunate because it comes up in a time in the church that 
the church was struggling to articulate what it really believed. And let, let me tell you a bit of a story. You see, in the first church, in the early church, the people sort of leading the church, leading the thought, leading the discussion were pastors. Paul, traveling pastor, right? Peter was a pastor in Jerusalem. All the people in the first centuries of the church who were sort of writing and thinking for the church were pastors. And they were... Uh, in the life of the church and working out how does a loving God love this people. What happens centuries later when the rise of scholasticism in the 1100s, 1200s or so is that the pastor becomes sort of pushed aside as secondary because now you have the academic. Now you have the monastic. Now you have the person who's sort of set aside to do all the thinking and, and praying and work of the, of the church, all the writing. And, and so what develops are the colleges and universities and, and monastic uh, gatherings. And, and they're the ones who start figuring out what we as Christians should believe. And there's this guy named Anselm who lays out what should you believe as a Christian about what happens on the cross, sacrifice all of this. And what he writes is what I described, that, that God and God's anger at our sin takes out Jesus instead of taking us out. And the problem with that is that he writes in a time of feudalism and chivalry. And when you think of chivalry, what do you think of? King Arthur? Monty Python, maybe? I mean, you think of like either, or stuff like that. You think of chivalry and treating people correctly. Um, that's not actually people's experience back then. In this time of chivalry and, and, and feudalism in which Anselm writes, every, most everyone was a peasant. And if you were a peasant, then you were under a knight who was then under a lord, who was then under the king, who was then under God. And so if you didn't do uh, your homage, your fealty, if you didn't respect the person above you fully, you either got right with them or they'd kill you. It was kind of a... a, a drastic setup to society, but if you were a peasant and you didn't respect your lord, the lord would take you out. And if you were a lord who didn't respect your king, the king would take you out. And if you were a king who didn't respect God, the thought was, well, God would take you out. I mean, so there is this, this logic of life where if you didn't give honor and, and fealty and homage to the person above you, you were in for it. And, and so in that context in that way of living in that culture in, in Western Europe of the time developed this idea that since God's at the top of the pyramid and if you don't respect every step along the pyramid God's gonna get you and thankfully God gets his son instead of getting you thank God right isn't that wonderful and that the problem with that is that it really doesn't resemble the God that we read of in Scripture. It doesn't resemble the God who is loving and caring and patient. Instead, it becomes this sort of wrathful, angry God who kills his only son instead of taking us out. And to show you how, how we get this wrong, I want to show you this to you, but I need five volunteers. All you have to do is hold a card. So I can get five people to come on up and hold a card for me. Penny, come on up. I know you want to. Doug, you don't want to, but you'll come anyways. <laughs> okay, two more. Oh, come on. Okay. You're off the hook. We kind of get in the line here, so they can all see you. Here, here's what ends up happening once, if, if we buy into Anselm in this. We, what we end up happening is we say that the Father crucifies Jesus so that he can forgive humanity. That ends up being the logic. You all do your Havana so everyone can see your... That ends up being the logic of, of, of how we think about what happens on the cross. And the problem with that is that it's not actually scriptural. Because if you start reading... You just stay there for just a minute. You'll be done soon. Uh, if you re start reading through Acts and you start reading through how Peter describes what happened to Jesus... What he says are things like, you Israelites, you crucified and killed Jesus, Acts 2. Acts 3, you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead, Acts 5. The God, the God of our ancestors raised up, raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging on a tree, Acts 7. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. And so who is it that crucifies Jesus? Is it an angry God that crucifies Jesus so that he can forgive us? No, it really isn't. It's not the Father who crucifies Jesus, so it's you who crucifies Jesus. It's, it's humanity, so come here. And so you stand right there. And so if it's humanity who crucifies Jesus, then the Father is the one... 
Actually, you two switch. This is actually the logic that we read of in Scripture. Humanity crucifies Jesus, and then the Father forgives us. A little bit different, right? That's a very different way of understanding it. It's not an angry father killing his son so that we can be off the hook. It's that we crucified Jesus, and the Father forgave us, even though we did something so horrible. Okay, thank you. That's the logic that, if you actually read Scripture and look at how it is presented, that's the logic of it. That, that's, the, that's the flaw to the God is angry. It's not that God is angry. It's, it's that we are angry and God forgives us. There, there, and if you want to start getting into, well, what exactly happened? I mean, that, that's kind of the logic. We crucified Jesus and the Father forgives us. If you want to get into the details of what actually happens on the cross above and beyond that, if you ask, what does the Bible say what happens on the cross? What does the blood actually do? There's no one actual answer. I'll give you seven right now. First answer, you can find in uh, the New Covenant begins with the, with a, the, the sharing of, of blood. This is my blood of the covenant poured out for many. The Last Supper, right? That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it, Jesus' blood purifies. We find that in Hebrews and in 1 John. The blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin. In Revelation 7, that th those who have gone through the great ordeal have washed their, their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Imagine washing robes in blood. Blech. But that, that's blood cleans, uh, cleans, right? Third way to think about it. Jesus' blood redeems us from slavery to sin. Ephesians 1. In him we have redemption through his blood. 1 Peter 1. We are ransomed from our futile ways through the blood of Jesus. And, and so this, this way of thinking about it is the ransom is what you pay for your freedom. And so Jesus pays the cost, pays the ransom so that we might be free. And the one he pays is the one who holds us in bondage. Satan. And so the, the, the payment is not demanded by an angry father, but by an evil one. Fourth way of thinking of this. Jesus' blood gives us life. John 6, 53. We eat his flesh and drink his blood and have eternal life. So this is the idea that you are what you eat. If you want to live forever, eat Jesus. He lives forever. Another way of thinking about this. Jesus' blood justifies us against accusers. This is in Revelation 12. The accuser has been thrown down who has been conquered by the blood of the Lamb. A sixth way to think about this. Jesus' blood reconciles. It's in Ephesians 2. You who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. A seventh way to think about this. Jesus' blood gives confidence and assurance. We are, this comes up in Hebrews. It is with confidence we can enter the sanctuary by the blood of, of Jesus. I just think I just quoted more scripture at you in three minutes than I ever have before. And if you get lost in the mix of it, I'm sorry, but I think you see the point. That if you're looking for the one answer for what the Bible says about what happens with the blood of Jesus, I mean, there's the basic logic, we crucified uh, Jesus and the Father forgives us. And if you want to get into the weeds on that and you want to find the one answer... It, it's not there. What we have in the Bible, it, in, especially in the New Testament, is this long discussion amongst the people who are writing the letters of the New Testament. We have this long discussion amongst themselves as they're trying to figure out that it's, it, it's something like this. Or maybe it's a little bit like that. Or maybe it's a little bit like this. And, and it turns out that there's not any one answer, and to try to figure out one answer would be to try to, would be kind of miss out on, on what the point of, of this is. For to sit in front of the cross and to observe the cross is not a problem to solve, but something beautiful to enjoy. Right? You sit in front of a great painting, Mona Lisa, right? If you ever, anyone here ever seen the Mona Lisa in person? If someone asks you to sit in front of the Mona Lisa and tell you what, what makes it beautiful, what's the one thing that makes it beautiful, do you think that's even a question worth asking? No. When it comes to great art, there, there's no one answer. Why is Michael Jackson's music so catchy? I, I can't tell you. I just know it is. Well, why, why is this painting or why is that music so beautiful? I, I, we can look at aspects of it, but there's no one answer. And so if we want to talk about the cross today, there's no one answer I can give you. I could tell you that the, on the cross, we send our, all of our sins into Jesus and he forgave us. I could say that on the cross, Jesus became the scapegoat so that we would stop scape, scapegoating others. At the cross, we discover a God who would rather die than kill his enemies. 
On the cross, we see God's alternative to the sword. On the cross, we see the rightful king of the world crowned. We can see all these aspects of the cross. That the, the cross is when Jesus judges sin and casts out Satan and refounds the world. We can talk about all the things the cross is, but it, there's no one way to look at it. It's, it's like facets of a beautiful diamond. My friends, what we see on the cross is that God the Father doesn't kill Jesus. It's not an angry father killing his son instead of taking us out. What we see on the cross is what God endures because of what, what we did to him and how God forgives us for it. The cross and the blood spilled there, the sacrifice that Jesus makes, is the coming together of the ugliest part of humanity and the most beautiful part of God's love. We sinned and he forgives. At the cross, Jesus doesn't save us from an angry God. Instead, Jesus reveals a God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, even knowing what the world would do to him. Amen.